Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7 Israel at War update, and this is the 26th day since the Islamist terror organizations from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on Israel's south, murdering some 1,400 mostly civilians and wounding over 4,800 others. Joining me from an undisclosed location to keep you updated from here in Israel is Brigadier General and Reserve Doron Gavish, who is the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense. Thank you for joining us, General. What can you update us with from the latest? Well, Jonathan, um, when we're talking about the last uh, 24 hours, I think it is uh, really important to highlight that, uh, as you said, there were uh, some uh, military success that uh, we saw, the interception of the missile coming from the Red Sea is uh, one of them. Uh, but also, unfortunately, uh, we had some uh, life that were uh, lost by some of uh, our soldiers uh, to remind everyone that uh, this is the war that uh, we are engaging. Uh, so in general, we could say that uh, the war against Hezbollah is uh, continuing. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, a fight uh, uh, by the IDF in all it is uh, dimensions. The Air Force is uh, fiercely striking the Hamas, mainly, of course, the Hamas, as we always emphasize it, and also uh, close support to the ground forces, uh, which are enlarging their uh, maneuvers in the last uh, few days. Uh, the Hamas is uh, still uh, shooting rockets uh, through the cities of Israel. We see it uh, all along this uh, war while we are striking the Hamas uh, and not striking uh, civilians, trying to do whatever we can in order not to hit uh, civilians. Uh, by the way, it is uh, also important to mention that uh, together with the United States, uh, Egypt uh, and Israel, there was an area that was designated uh, for the population in the Gaza Strip so they could uh, go to uh, there are humanitarian uh, uh, possibilities uh, over there, uh, water, uh, food and other uh, supplies. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, what we are continuously seeing is the Hamas uh, trying to hold them and not <clears throat> allow them to go to those areas uh, because he really sees these uh, people as their uh, human shields. And, and we see that, unfortunately, there are civilians that are being hit. And this is something that we must blame the Hamas for his uh, cynicism, for, uh, you know, having all their infrastructure, military infrastructure under uh, uh, civilian uh, housing, uh, schools, uh, mosques, uh, hospitals, and so on. So we, we continuously see it in the south. Uh, of course, from the north in the last uh, few days, we are still uh, under the war uh, threshold uh, with the Hezbollah, although we saw some uh, rockets that were uh, shot at Israel, uh, some uh, UAVs and also some anti-tank units. But all of those were uh, encountered by the Israeli, uh, by the IDF. Uh, the, the missiles were uh, interception, the intercepted, uh, also the UAVs and the anti-tank uh, rockets. Uh, of course, it is uh, important to mention that uh, we saw yesterday, and uh, not for the first time, uh, uh, that we had this uh, threat coming from the Red Sea. And this one, it was intercepted by the, uh, uh, this time by the Arrow, applying the multi-tier uh, defense uh, of Israel. But I'm sure that uh, we will talk about it uh, in the next few minutes, so I would hold you. Thank you, General Gavish. I think it's very important to highlight that when we're looking at the region right now, prospects of miscalculation are at an all-time high. And we need to understand that those complexities may very rapidly change the scenario that we're currently in into a multi-sector war. Obviously, this would have severe implications, not only for Israel, but also for the entire world, considering the fact that Babel Mandab, other waterways that are in close proximity to both uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and its various proxies throughout the region uh, are waterways of transit for a lot of civilian cargo, commercial cargo, uh, the, the gas and, and oil, the LNG that tra transits those uh, waterways in order to reach Europe following a diversion from, of course, Russian uh, gas towards uh, countries such as Qatar uh, has put Europe once again uh, in a very fragile position. 
Nevertheless, I'd like to immediately also turn to retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who is the former, a former U.S. Uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Thank you for joining us, General. What can you tell us from an American perspective right now as we're looking, obviously, about uh, a growing deployment of U.S. forces on the ground throughout the region? We heard about the deployment also of Patriot missiles in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And uh, there are not a few complexities which Central Command as well as Euro uh, uh, European Command need now to calibrate with one another to contend with. Well... I'm certainly not worried about that coordination. That coordination between those commanders goes on all of the time. Uh, it's routine, it's active, and uh, we've been doing it for years. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize right now, Israel is looking at the problem from the inside out. You know, what's happening directly in Israel, directly in Gaza, and then starts looking at the periphery around Israel, uh, obviously Syria, Lebanon, so on and so forth. Uh, it would appear to me that the U.S. is starting to look from the outside in. I think what's most important for the United States, as you said, was protecting the waterways, uh, regional deterrence efforts, bringing in additional troops to help deter Iran, to help deter any other militants, for example, inside of Iraq, who have already knocked out 25 different attacks in the last couple of weeks. And then as we get closer and closer to the support for Israel, that's when we're starting to bring in regional air defense assets, putting them in places such as Jordan, and obviously augmenting what's happening inside of Israel as well. So I think the notion is let's have Israel focus from the inside out and we'll focus from the outside in. And it seems to be a good combination to both fight the war uh, and support Israel's effort to fight the war, as well as on the outside, focusing on the regional deterrence efforts so this doesn't uh, turn into, as our uh, friends said, a regional conflagration, because that would be the worst possible thing of all. Indeed. Well, also joining our conversation is retired Lieutenant General Klaus-Peter uh, Stiglitz, who is the former Luftwaffe uh, Chief of Staff uh, with the German uh, Air Force, of course. Thank you for joining us, General. When you look at the, the various complexities, uh, considering the fact that uh, obviously we see both the, the Israeli Air Force heavily engaged in Gaza and then also engaged in Syria and in uh, Lebanon particularly, but also the American Air Force is obviously engaged uh, uh, sporadically every time trying to retaliate pinpointed, of course, the last retaliation was uh, several days ago against RGC locations in uh, the Al-Bukamal area in uh, eastern Syria. Uh, nevertheless, if the localized war in Gaza would turn into a regional conflagration, what do you see as an operational challenge for the air forces uh, conducting the various affairs on the offensive front? Well, uh, I think uh, we all saw that the initial threat uh, on the 3rd of October uh, came from a comparatively small region, which was the Gaza Strip. And, uh, and uh, the political discussion after uh, the war started and the, uh, the Israeli Air Force was uh, the first to answer very precisely and, uh, and with uh, high effort that uh, the political discussion already came that uh, it was feared that uh, this conflict would uh, would lighten and would go only directional so i thought that the the initial step by the israel uh, government to to uh, get 300 300,000 people uh, men and women under arms that was a correct step to prepare themselves not only for uh, the threat coming from Gaza, but maybe to look into the other region, to north, south, and uh, and to the east uh, of the Israel territory, to for for this kind of protection. Uh, when we talk about the, the capabilities uh, of the air force, um, it's very well known, and uh, since Israel is a very very small country in terms of territory, uh, they can fight uh, uh, the war uh, omnidirectional maybe better than uh, any other nation uh, can do because uh, they have a short distance, short flying times, and the erection times are much better than in any other Air Force. And uh, I think that is one of the things um, they have to consider. Uh, but uh, when it has been mentioned by you, Doron, 
that there has been an attack from the Red Sea uh, uh, in the past, uh, just recently, that uh, this probably uh, would come uh, into focus uh, for maybe the next days, and this uh, needs to be prepared for. The General Dolon, your take on things? Well, uh, of course, and I think that uh, the other thing that uh, we saw in the in the Red Sea is the really the cooperation uh, between uh, Israel, the United States, and and all the region. Uh, let's say the the the, the right players in, in this uh, region, and uh, it was uh, those targets that came a few days ago were intercepted uh, by the uh, United States uh, naval forces. And uh, of course, the last ones that were uh, shot were intercepted by us. Uh, some of it, by the way, we're talking about the missiles, but there were also uh, cruise missiles that were intercepted uh -uh. By, both by the United States uh, uh, Navy and also the Israeli Air Force. So uh, there, is a, there is a great operation. I think that, uh, you know, we should look on this, I would say, arena proportionally. Uh, the threat is there, but uh, the real threat is uh, is what could come from uh, uh, from the north and from the east and uh, we are uh, prepared so we are alert for uh, all kind of uh, targets that could come uh, uh, from the red sea but uh, we take it in the the right uh, proportion but um, you know it is of course important to say that uh, the idf was uh, ready and it is also important to mention that uh, we applied the multi-tier uh, system uh, which means that uh, while uh, rockets are being shot toward the city of, of Israel, uh, the Iron Dome in, is intercepting them on the lower tier, and at the same time there is a missile coming from the Red Sea, and the arrow is intercepting them in the upper tier, and in between there are uh, some other different tiers. So it is, uh, I would say, impressive if I might be we should be humble, but I think it is impressive uh, to see that all this uh, multi-tier system is uh, functioning, is working, and is basically allowing defense of the Israeli uh, citizens. I think also uh, we should say it the way it is. Uh, also, General Michael Carilla has been also very active and engaged in making sure that the work that Frank McKenzie, General Frank McKenzie, who headed CENCOM before him, uh, and integrated basically this architecture of the region, uh, really did a, a fantastic job and prepared for such a contingent that may occur. And, and everybody already expected something like this to occur, considering Iran's malign activities throughout the region uh, were never a secret to anyone. Everybody is aware of it, and everybody knows who the real bad actor here is. And therefore, I'd like to ask you, General Kimmett, when we're looking at the various complexities at hand, obviously, when I look at the United States, I, I see the, the foreign policy projected from the Pentagon, which is unequivocal, very clear, and very precise in making sure that both U.S. interests are upheld as well as other uh, interests that are related to partners and allies in the region. Nevertheless, there are mixed messages every time coming out of, of the White House and of uh, state, less than it used to be, but still there is lack of a whole of government approach, which doesn't seem to uh, really maybe understands the, the uh, full scope of the challenge, but nonetheless maintains the considerations of uh, politics of uh, domestic issues. Yeah, I, what I would suggest is that uh, this is probably the best and the worst of what we see in a, a democratic society controlled by civilians. Uh, it's the best because they give us the money, the time, the effort, and the people to have among the best militaries in the world. And you can imagine that Carilla is not necessarily worried about the upcoming presidential elections or primaries. Mike Carilla is focused exclusively on war fighting. It's something he does very, very well. He's at 20 years of practice. But he doesn't have to worry about what the civilians worry about. The civilians also worry about the domestic consequences and the international consequences of these actions. Now, so I, I appreciate both positions of what the military does, and I'm glad we don't have a politicized military. Uh, and at the same time, I'm glad that we don't have a militarized uh, bureaucracy. So that balance, uh, while it appears to be uh, bifurcated, I think it actually blends pretty well. 
but it is clear that there is growing uh, lack of support or less and less support on a day-to-day basis coming out of the administration than we saw on October 7th. Part of that is due to domestic considerations. Part of that is simply due to the fact that uh, uh, in America, the news cycle is 24 hours, and in many ways, so is the bureaucratic cycle. And they're less interested in what's going on right now, sadly, um, and they're more focused on other domestic issues, new Speaker of the House, so on and so forth. That's something that the domestic politicians need to worry about, and the domestic bureaucracy needs to worry about. Mike Carrillo, of course, has the absolute uh, autonomy to be focused on the situation in his region 24-7 on a military basis. Nevertheless, if I may follow uh, up one question on this, and that is, whatever happens in this region will have dire consequence, uh, consequences on U.S. economy, which will then project issues on uh, domestic <laughs> politics. So where's the disconnect? Well, the disconnect, quite frankly, Jonathan, is the news cycle. Uh, the news cycle forecasts out uh, about 24 to 48 hours, or it starts looking long term at uh, the upcoming election cycle. And foreign policy rarely, if ever, turns an election. Uh, people vote on domestic issues. They don't necessarily vote on foreign policy issues, with the exception of Vietnam in the 1970s. So, uh, again, it's, it's a unique way of running this democracy. So, uh, you know Winston Churchill's old saying, democracy is the worst form of government except all others. But I think at the end of the day, you can be assured that this administration is going to be four square behind Israel's sovereignty and security, and you've got the military of the United States that's going to back that up 100%. Thank you, General. Well, I'd like to ask you also, uh, General uh, Stiglitz, when we're looking at the various complexities at hand, obviously there there is much consideration to, to factor in. And uh, when we're looking at lessons learned, particularly from the Ukraine-Russia war, is there something that Israel should potentially identify and integrate, as was, by the way, done in its uh, tank uh, platoons were uh, lessons learned from Ukraine about the drones dropping small munitions on commanders uh, popping their heads out was uh, therefore then uh, modified and, and implemented on the field. Well, uh, although I'm not uh, very, very close to what is happening on the battlefield in the Ukraine as well as in uh, Israel, when I compare these uh, two war sites, uh, there are a lot of differences, and I think you cannot really uh, draw a line between the Ukraine war uh, uh, and uh, to, to how Israel is defending itself. When I um, was um, witnessing a meeting in Berlin uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, the preparedness of the Ukraine, and especially talking about the air war in the Ukraine, I asked the question that uh, at least when I, when I, what I see from, from the media and the press here in Germany and Europe, that an air war uh, over Ukraine is not uh, existing because the Russians do not understand air power. Uh, and uh, that is one of the big differences between the Ukrainian scenario and what we realize and what we see in, in Israel. And uh, so, and I mentioned that earlier, that the Israeli Air Force uh, was and is prepared to take this challenge uh, uh, omnidirectional, uh, starting from that small area of Gaza and going now probably uh, omnidirectional. And uh, what we see in, uh, in the media here in Germany and in, in, in Europe is uh, mostly at night. And I think that is one of the advantages uh, that uh, this uh, air war can can be conducted at night, so uh, for for their own for their own protection. So uh, if we talk about drones and uh, and these kind of stuff, I think um, the uh, the rockets and uh, based ground based uh, rockets which are being launched by the Hamas, uh, uh, they go uh, undirected. Uh, they uh, they just go into a certain region. They go into a certain distance, and they have uh, nothing to do with what uh, what is happening over the Ukraine, where long distance uh, drones are being employed, 
at, uh, at the targets, uh, which normally you would not understand if we talk about any kind of employing power, if it's uh, ground power or it's, it's uh, air power. Indeed. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity also to highlight uh, the humanitarian issues at hand, considering the fact that uh, Israel obviously seized importance of preserving uh, the the uh, safe zones, so to speak, within southern Gaza, and to try and do its utmost uh, in protecting the hum uh, humanitarian corridors as well as particularly the, the population, the non-combatant population of the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. Uh, nevertheless, there, there is a very large complexity when we're talking about the, the fine line between force protection and the humanitarian issues at play. And therefore, I'd, I'd like to ask particularly General Kimmett in this uh, 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 context, how do you see that fine line being preserved, considering the fact that ultimately Israel also needs to, t to take its own force protection into consideration? Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Jonathan. And again, the great crux, as you well know, is the ability to pr provide humanitarian supplies to the civilians, but at the same time, making sure that humanitarian supplies don't end up in the hands of the enemy. And quite candidly, that the people delivering those humanitarian uh, 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 supplies uh, are actually civilians and not Hamas fighters in Hamas fighters in disguise. Uh, it, but it fundamentally goes to the issue about public support around the world for this war. Uh, that is why the United States continues to uh, negotiate with and, quite frankly, pressure Israel to allow more and more humanitarian aid to come in. If you want to continue to get American uh, support, American public support that affects that government that we talked about earlier, uh, this war has got to be seen as uh, relatively just and and the the humanitarian aid being provided to the civilians uh, would seem to be a prerequisite among the American people in order to maintain uh, that public support for this effort and trust in the Israeli Defense Forces. Indeed. Well, I'd like to ask you, General Gavi, since uh, we don't have very much time left, what are the complexities moving forward? Well, I think that, uh, of course, this is a very uh, complex uh, war uh, because those are uh, urban areas. But uh, as we mentioned again and again, the IDF is really doing uh, whatever it can in order to strike the Hamas and not to hit uh, those that uh, are not involved. Uh, but, uh, you know, those complexities would uh, be with us along the, the next uh, probably weeks and even uh, more than this. And of course, the defense of our own uh, soldiers, which are fighting in a very, uh, I would say, complex area, as you uh, put it. Um, and, and I would say th this is uh, probably something that uh, uh, would go on uh, for the last, uh, uh, for the next uh, few, uh, few weeks. Something that I'd like to respond to our viewers, many have uh, sent messages, why not to flood the tunnels? Uh, just uh, to put things in perspective, uh, the tunnels under the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, estimates are talking about roughly 500 kilometers of tunnels dug throughout this uh, enclave, uh, despite being a relatively small territory. Uh, nonetheless, uh, when Hamas smuggled weapons from Egypt through tunnels, from the Sinai Peninsula into uh, the Gaza Strip, Egypt tackled that by indeed digging along the border between Rafa, uh, the, the Egyptian side of Rafa uh, town and, and uh, uh, Palestinian side of the Rafa town, and uh, filled it with water and actually is growing shrimps in those areas. Nevertheless, uh, when we're talking about the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, there are currently 240 civilians being held captive uh, by the terrorist organization, the majority of them civilians, many of them being foreign nationals. I think that we're talking about roughly 50 or so from Thailand, yeah. particularly, and uh, even more, of course, but there are still ongoing efforts to figure out who exactly is there and, and uh, nothing can be uh, confirmed until everything is confirmed indeed by uh, facts and not by uh, 
speculation. We have roughly one minute left. Last sentence from you, General uh, Kimmett. Uh, I think uh, the question was quickly asked about the dirt between Ukraine and uh, uh, the war that you're fighting right now. I think many of these wonder weapons that we're seeing that have been so consequential in the fight in Ukraine, drones, precision weapons, signals intelligence, uh, in many ways, those are not going to have as much effect in an asymmetric battle uh, that you're facing and will face inside of Gaza City. General uh, Stiglitz, uh, last sentence from you. Well, um, I doubt uh, that this conflict uh, will end uh, over the next days or uh, a few weeks. Uh, so uh, I personally keep my fingers crossed that uh, uh, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces uh, can do their best to defend their country. On the other hand, I think uh, many political uh, initiatives has to come up uh, in order to, to, uh, to, to shorten this uh, conflict. Uh, of course, to shorten this conflict and to have less severe things for uh, the civilian people which are involved in the Gaza and other areas that which are involved. General Gavish, last sentence. I think we should uh, remember the goals of this war and saying that uh, the IDF is very determined to achieve them. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank General Gavish, General Kimmet, and General Stiglitz for taking out of your times to uh, update us. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Following this, we will have uh, both TV7 Israel news broadcast at 9 p.m. Jerusalem time, after which we will have yet again a geostrategic uh, panel to discuss uh, the latest uh, from a strategic perspective. And therefore, uh, until then, from here in Jerusalem, shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion.